She had never seen people dance this way before. Janie guessed that the performers ranged in age between 10 and 15 years old. The youngest, a boy with ringlets that clung tightly to his head, was moving his shoulders in one direction and his hips in the other. His body seemed disconnected, as though it were really two bodies spliced together. One of the other boys, closer to 15, Janie guessed, was hanging upside down from one of the subway car's poles and tapping his feet on the ceiling as the car rattled. The music emanating from their boombox increased in tempo and one of the boys, there were five in total, took off his baseball cap and began to roll it up and down one of his arms. It balanced precariously on the tip of his elbow but did not tumble and in a few swift moves he tossed it into the air and caught it on his head. Ginny had tried not to gawk at first, looking down occasionally at her copy of The Giver by Lois Lowry. It is one of the first books she'd been assigned to read to, for school that she actually looked forward to reading. She liked the protagonist, Jonas, and his compassion and sensitivity. Having just begun middle school, where it seemed like everyone was always trying to look like someone else, to act carelessly cool even though they most definitely cared about being cool, she felt turning to her book was like taking a breath of fresh air. She hated the way that people talked behind each other's backs, said mean things about classmates they hardly knew, and sometimes even meaner things about those whom they called their friends. Yes, Janie looked forward to reading, and normally she would lose herself in a story, blackout strangers' music pulsing from their headphones, clicking pens, and other distractions. These dancers had managed to distract her, though, and she was glad for it. Janie now let herself stare unabashedly at the performance, which was coming to an end. In the last climactic act, one of the older boys took one of the younger ones by the ankles and launched him toward the ceiling. He grabbed onto the bars that ran along the top of the car, swung himself forward, somersaulted in the air on the way back down, and landed on his two feet in the middle of the car. Everyone applauded and some reached for their wallets. Then the train screeched to a slow stop and Janie's eyes shifted up to the window. Her stomach sank. She had missed her stop two stops back. She shoved her book in her backpack and hurried off the train in a daze. Then she snapped out of it, noticing a train on the opposite tracks. Janie sprinted down the stairs through the walkway under the tracks and back up to the other side, just in time to watch the doors shut. Paper signs informed her that there was construction this weekend and trains would be running less frequently than normal, just one every 30 minutes. It had been three months and Janie started riding the train on her own, and in that time she had followed her mother's instructions to go only between home and school. She felt comfortable, cool, and empowered riding the train alone, so she was surprised by how unsettled it made her to be in a new station by herself. The station was stuffy and sweltering, and it smelled of sweat and trash. Janie studied the subway map behind a plastic wall, scratched with names, initials, and other little messages. She recognized this neighborhood. Her friend Derek lived here. Feeling reassured, she checked her watch and decided to go outside for 20 minutes or so. There was a warm breeze. She breathed it in gratefully, taking account of her surroundings. To her left, a toothless man sat smiling wide behind, beside a cardboard sign. She expected it to say something about being hungry and homeless. It didn't say anything at all. A picture of two stick figures holding hands did all the talking. To her right, a woman coaxed a pig's tail girl to stop crying. You'll get two treats once we get home if we just run this one last errand. Janie moved with the crowd across the street, finding herself in front of a small drum shop. Wooden drums, just like the one she sometimes saw two men play in the subway station, sat behind the window. Their bases were intricately carved and vibrant braided bands wrapped around them. Long strands of red, yellow, green, and black beads hung up in the front door. Without thinking, she opened the door and stepped in. Hey, darling, said a man sitting on a stool, stretching material over the hollow top of a drum base. He glanced up at her as he spoke, his warm voice and smile welcoming her like an old friend. He continued working as if he'd been expecting her, as if they had always chatted as he went about his business. I told them not to play with jewelry on, but do they listen to me? Nope. One free fix is all I can offer. Next time, they must pay me or find someone else. Or maybe I'll just take it back. The djembe is fun to play, but it's not a toy. No sticks, no rings, no watches, just hands. Djembe, she repeated under her breath. Yeah, djembe. You ever play one, darling? Yes, twisting and wrapping rope with an easy sort of focus. Nope, the top of the drum. What is that? It's the skin, goat skin. 
Wow, where from? Janie pictured the goats she used to play with at the petting zoo, where their bulging eyes, miniature beards, and sweet, silly croning. From my country, Senegal. Senegal. She had heard of the place, but never heard of someone from Senegal say the word. There was something beautiful in the way he said it. Swift and soft, yet distinct. You know where that is? Africa, Janie said, racking her brain for the map she had memorized in social studies class only a month ago. Somewhere in West Africa, near Mali, right? Look at you. I think you're the first American to come into this shop who knows a little something about this here map, he said, nodding toward a map of Africa in the corner. Janie smiled. For the record, I didn't see the map before. Okay, okay, he laughed, a belly laugh. I believe you. He started to tap the drum using the heel of his hand near the outside of the skin and slapping closer to the center with his fingers. Bap, bum, bap. He echoed the beats. The notes got louder, closer together until his hands were moving faster than Janie's eyes could follow. He broke up the pattern with an occasional improvisation. He made it look easy. He slowed down and the music softened, but the room still pulsed with energy. So you ready, darling? He smiled wide. Hmm, Janie answered, waiting for him to begin again. Well, then what are you waiting for? Come on over. He patted the stool beside him. Oh, well, I don't know if I'm much of a musician. She got back to her one painful one winter of trying the violin. She was more of a pottery kind of girl. And I don't know if I'm much of a teacher. Let's see what we can do, though. Janie glanced at her watch and thought of the dancers in the subway car. She wished she had some sort of talent that could captivate a group of people in that way. Five more minutes until she had to head back to the train. It was just enough time for a few beats of the drum and for her to decide that she'd be adding one more subway stop to her usual repertoire.